Big Mac is filling in yet again. How you doing, pal? Good, Evan. How are you? Well, listen, you know he can't be by himself. That's a problem. I know. Did you get any sleep last night after that Yankee game? I did, yes. I got some sleep, yes. I wasn't too thrilled with uh, the news that came right out after the game, but uh, I got some sleep. Dude, let me tell you something. And I'm a big Matt Carpenter guy. Yeah. I think everybody knows that. I love Matt Carpenter, and I've been right about Matt Carpenter. You have been. I mean, he is the... The soul of this Yankee team. Another Cashman gem. Oh, yeah, no doubt. When he fouls that ball off his foot, yeah. I know my guy. Yeah. I know him. You know how sometimes <laughs> they say... You can you, feel it. You can feel the pain of a relative yeah. because you're so close to them. Sure. I'm sitting in my bed. I'm a little bit behind in this game, mm-hmm. so it's kind of weird how the time thing works. Yeah. So I'm like 20 minutes behind. I'm sitting in my bed. I finally got the kids asleep. The Mets won because, you know, they're the Mets. And as I see Matt swing and that ball hits his foot, all of a sudden, this pain went through my foot. I couldn't even figure it out. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. And I said to my wife. Sympathy pains. I said, honey, I think I broke my foot. And she said, excuse me? I said, yeah. She's like, you're just sitting here. I said, I'm telling you, I think I broke my foot. Then I realized it wasn't me. Right. It was Matt. Mm -hmm. And you knew it. You could see the look in his eyes. And he did finish the at-bat because he's a tough guy. Yeah. And he wanted to drive that run in. But you knew from the get-go that was a problem, and then they actually broke the news in the middle of the broadcast. I yeah. think it was like the sixth or seventh inning yeah. when my good friend Ryan Rucco said, uh-oh, we got breaking news, and the break is the break. And that sucks, man, because this guy's been fantastic. They kind of need his bat. And I yeah, hope for him of. and I hope for you that he's able to come back within five weeks. Yeah, I mean, obviously you'd love to have him have an impact this entire down the stretch, but like we talked about yesterday, they're now back to ten and a half games up the – the Blue Jays lost again to the streaking Orioles. So the lead's back up to double digits. I'm not too concerned about this team going down the stretch. You're looking for this team to be postseason ready. And in the short term, it hurts more than it does in the long term. Hopefully it does come back. Short term, Rizzo on his second four-game excursion with back issues. Who knows how many times that's going to pop up. It's not like the back pain lingers. That's not a thing. And then obviously Stanton. So yeah, down the stretch, it's going to hurt. But if he can come back, if he can still be a part of it, I fully expect him to be able to come back and in the swing of things and be able to play if that foot heals. But it's a devastating injury. You feel bad for it's one of those things where you feel bad for the Yankees, obviously. As a Yankee fan, you feel bad for, you know, your opportunity here to continue to win and continue to play well down the stretch and seal off this division and get into the postseason. But you feel bad for him too. He was putting together a remarkable comeback from, I'm glad from you said nowhere. That. And to 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 watch him do what he's done for the Yankees and hit the way he's hit, to have it end on a foul ball like that, well, hopefully that's not the end. I'm glad you said you feel bad for him because yeah. I feel bad for him, and I think most people listening, whether you're a Met fan or a Yankee fan, you feel bad for Matt Carpenter. And here's what's so funny about sports. We all universally feel bad for Matt Carpenter. Yes. He got hurt. Not his fault. He got hurt. <laughs> I think I know where you're going with this. And then you've got the big ticket himself, Makai Becton. Yeah. And I understand why there's a difference. Trust me, I get it. But Makai Becton yesterday injured his knee. And we'll get to Coach Sala, who initially said, yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. I think he's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. We find out today it is a big deal. If you're just tuning in, Makai Becton's done for the year. He's got like a ruptured, you know, knee cap or whatever the hell it is. I don't even know. All I know is he's going to be done for the season. And I think the natural reaction to that injury is to say, what a fat bust. That's the reaction. Now, I'm not going to say that because there is a part of me, while I acknowledge that Makai Becton has not done anywhere near what we as Jet fans expected when he was selected 11th overall in 2020. He's played, I think, 14 games in the NFL through two seasons. Yep. That number is going to remain unchanged, which means three seasons into his NFL career, Makai Becton will have played 14 games with 13 of them being in his rookie season. So I understand that there's sure. a frustration in terms of what he's been. But Makai Becton fracturing his kneecap sucks for Makai Becton. Of course. Because I'm sure, especially with the, all the critics that he's heard over the last few months yeah. about how he's fat and he's out of shape and all that, I'm sure there was a motivation to actually playing football and proving people wrong. Yeah. And this wasn't his fault. No. And but- I, I got to tell you, as a Jet fan... I do feel bad for Makai Becton. I can, I can tell you right off. When you're heavy set, you get no breaks. All right, so everyone's all over him because he's fat and he's lazy, and those are the impressions you get for you know being the size he is. And then even you know his weight was an issue this entire off season. 
And, you know, that's a, the immediate reaction from the Jet fan is, you know what it is. It's like, they should have known this. I knew he wasn't going to play. We all knew it. Everyone knew he was going to get hurt. It was an obvious thing. He's out of shape. He's lazy. He's going to get hurt again. He's on bad knees. He weighs too much. How do you expect it? They should have went out and got more tackles. They should have addressed it in the draft. That's what you're hearing today and how what a disaster it is. Here we go again with the Jets. And I agree with you. I think this is much worse for him than it is the Jets. Well, here, here. I don't think it's I, – I mean, it's not that it's not – when he came in, remember, obviously, Andrew Thomas was the bust. Right. And Becton was the one pushing people all over the field. Because the, in his rookie and season. And the Giants blew it. Well, in his rookie season, Becton was better than Andrew Thomas. Oh, no question. He was. No question. And he was not only that, the way he moved at his size, he looked like someone who's special. Not just better than Andrew Thomas, special. Yeah. And for it to completely go this way now, it's very frustrating to watch. But at the same time, of all the problems the Jets have had uh, last year, the year before, I've really felt like the offensive line, even without him, has started to kind of solidify. The offensive line was the best part of the New no York question. Jets last year, no period. Yeah. And I defy any Jet fan to disagree with that. Now, you could say, well, look at look at their defense. Look at their secondary. Look at this. Look at that. Yeah. The New York Jets offensive line a year ago was good. In fact, pro football focus ranked them as the 11th best offensive line in the league. That's not bad. Not bad for a team who plays the way the Jets do, no. So, they were the 11th best offensive line in football. I agree with those rankings. I mean, I'm not watching every snap of every other team, but I can tell you as a Jet fan watching every snap, their offensive line was their strength last year. Mm -hmm. How many snaps did Mekhi Becton play last year as the Jets had the 11th best offensive line in the NFL? And there's your answer. And so, and I know that there are Jet fans at the time and I respect this, at the time that said, go get an offensive lineman with two of those top ten picks. Yep. I wasn't one of them. I know. And I wasn't saying it because I thought Mekhi Becton was going to be healthy. I never thought Mekhi Becton was going to be healthy because his track record has said he's not healthy. Right. I did it because there were other areas of this football team that needed to get better. And that even without Mekhi Becton, even without him, this offensive line had a chance to be good. One of my reasons why George Fant needed to be the left tackle and Mekhi Becton on the right side was because, hey, George Fant's a better left tackle and struggled when he played on the right side, but also because I can't rely on Mekhi Becton. Right. And I don't want to move him back to left tackle, have him get hurt three weeks into the season, and have to shuffle my entire offensive line. Right. So when you look at this football team moving forward, I don't believe this injury should affect what our expectations are for them. It shouldn't at all. It shouldn't even change our expectations for this line. Now, should they go out and sign Dwayne Brown? Sure. Dwayne right. Brown's 38 years old, and he's been unsigned this entire offseason. So I'm skeptical he doesn't have much left. But at this point, why the hell not? Yeah. You want to bring him in? You want to teach him the right side? I wouldn't play him at left tackle. I wouldn't play no. him at left tackle and then move George Fant to the right no. side because Fant's a better left Fant's tackle. left tackle. Period. Period. Assuming he's healthy, and hopefully he is. Yeah. But this is more about A. Becton and B, as a Jet fan, we have all this history yep. of crappy first-round picks. You'll hear all about it Thursday at 2 o'clock when Joe <laughs> comes back. Bro, you want me to give you the list? We know a list. I know my list. And unfortunately, and it pains me to say this because I'm sick. I am sick and tired as a Jet fan of reading off the names and remembering the names of all the first-round picks in the annals of Jet history mm -hmm. that have been bust for various reasons. The reality is, it is because of health. Mekhi Becton's one of them. No question. He's now, a bust. He's a bust. He's a bust. He's not going to play football. No. But he was a bust last year, and like you said, the offensive line came together and was the best unit on the team. This was an opportunity to see, and I remember you mentioned during the draft, part of it was, to be fair though, I think part of it was, if you remember during the draft, it was, well, if, if they draft a, a, a tackle, mm -hmm. they're signifying they're done with Becton. Like, that was kind of the feel, too. Like, yeah, it's just allocation to the team. Like you said, there's other spots to do it. Plus, you have Becton right. in there. If you draft a, a tackle, Becton's no longer a part of this team. So they did have plans for him, and you were hoping that if he did come back and play right tackle and look the way he did in his rookie season, you did have aspirations of maybe this offensive line not being the 11th best, but top five sure, best. Sure, sure, and some sure. way to, to – so, I mean, it is – it's a it is a bummer for the team as much as it is for Becton, but you can move on from it and – once you and he is a bust, there's no question about it. But he's kind of been a bust since the last time he played. He's been like a, this is yeah. It's not like today we wake up and Becton's a bust. Until he got on the field and proved otherwise, he's been a bust for a year. Well, the now. funny thing is when he plays football, he's not. No, when he plays that's football, fair. He's, he's good. good. He's good. The problem is he's barely played football. Right. I mean, the last two years of his NFL career, he will have played one football game, and that's just not enough. No. 
But if I made a list going into training camp, because my biggest worry as a football fan, I think all of us have this same worry. Mm -hmm. My biggest worry is injuries. My biggest worry is exactly what happened to Carl Lawson a year ago. Right. All we heard about was how great Carl Lawson looks in training camp or the difference he's going to make on this defense, Mm -hmm. and then boom, he's out for the year. And I fear that as a football fan. I think we all do. Now, you can't live life fearful. That's why I understand why Brian Dayball is going to play his regulars on Thursday night when the Giants play their first preseason game. You can't wrap everyone up in bubble wrap. I get that. But my biggest fear is injuries. If I was going to make a list, Mm. and maybe one night I should have, and maybe I still can, because when I can't sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning, I make weird lists. But if I made a list (laughs) of the guys the Jets can't lose, if they lose this guy, we're bleeped. If I made that list, Makai Becton wouldn't have been in the top 20. Yep. I agree with you. But it's because of the name. It's because of the draft pick. It's because of the weight. It's because of the conversation. Or I mean, for, for during the minicamps, he was the topic for the minicamps. He New was York the Jets. conversation. That yeah. was the conversation. Yes. So to have the fear feel inevitable and then for it to happen this early into camp, it's just it's a frustrating thing. But I agree with you. He's not in the top 20 to put it your way, of guys they can't afford to lose. And that's He's why for, you move on from it. For any it Jet fan who thinks I am super negative, I may be super negative at yeah. times, but I also got to call it like it is. I felt bad for Makai back then. I understand all the weight questions about him. I think this kid wanted to play football. All right. I don't believe he's just going through the motions and doesn't give a rat's ass. And for him to basically tear up his kneecap, you know, weeks into training camp sucks. And it sucks for him. But as a New York Jet fan looking at this upcoming season, a season I am excited about, I would actually say it's the most excited I've been about a football season since 2012. Yeah. Uh, Why not? Based on all the crap we've watched for a decade and the hope for the future. And that doesn't mean the Jets. Sad state of affairs. But it's a reality state of affairs. it's, It's hard to just say. Of course it's sad. Yeah. But I understand sadness. We all understand <laughs> sadness. You know what I got to tell you, though? To your point, though, when you found out the news, and even though, yeah, your coach kind of made you feel better about it, which is frustrating, I understand. But when we got the news yesterday, I I didn't see – you didn't even almost flinch. Well, I expected it, it. It didn't even bother you. Because – Like, you were just like, oh, okay. And then and then Sala comes out and says, well, we don't think it's that bad, and you felt a little bit better. But even when it first happened, it was almost just like, here we go. No big deal. Because I expected it. Yeah. How did any Jet fan not ex- – and I expected it, but it's not like you're expecting Jacob deGrom to get hurt. Right. Because Jacob deGrom is different in a way. I looked at what I watched last year for the New York Jets, and I remember having this conversation with a few other Jet fans. Beningo and I had this conversation yeah. a few months ago. I'm sure he'll remember it when we're on the air in a couple of days. And that was, hey, best part about the Jets in 2021 was their offensive line. Right. It was the best part. And this guy barely played. Yeah. I mean, he he didn't play essentially. He didn't. The Sala thing, here's the thing that annoys me about Sala. And I guess it's almost me pushing for managers and coaches to not say anything, which is the opposite of what we want as fans and certainly what people want in the media. When Robert Sala alluded to, hey, I don't think it's serious, it relaxed me. Again, not that I was overly concerned. No, you weren't. Okay. It looks like he's going to be fine. This is a minor injury. And he turned out to be wrong. And I know today at his press conference, he explained why he was wrong. And I appreciate that. I appreciate why Robert Sala thought this was minor. We didn't see structural damage. Whatever the hell he said. Yeah, that's pretty much what they said. Honestly, the initial, the ACL is fine. This is fine. The knee seems structurally fine. Okay. And then a- MRIs and x-rays revealed the break. Okay. This is why. It's like what George <laughs> W. Bush used to do. He used to go. Now, this analogy is going to work. Always back to presidents. Well, it was a good one. President Bush would set the bar very, very low in debates. You know, like, hey, if I put a (laughs) sentence together, I did a hell of a job. Then he would come out (laughs) against Al Gore and John Kerry, and people would say, boy, W won the debate. Yeah, because he set the bar low. It was brilliant. Yes. Part of of my respect for him. Yes. So what I wanted... The stupid card earns respect. What I wanted Sala to do was say, boy, I think his knee may fall off. I got to tell you. I don't know if he's ever going to walk again. <laughs> and then if the report comes out that he's fine, it's like, oh, great. Or don't say anything. Yeah. Or don't just say Never well, give good news if you don't have it for sure. Yes. That's 100%. Yes. Never give good news if you don't know it for sure. Dude, here's my analogy. You're married. I'm married. Yeah. Rosenberg has no idea about marriage. Right. Would you ever want to tell your wife something that's good news no. that you can't deliver on? No. Never. Can you imagine I, that? All, I, I went to the George uh, Bush school for that, too. I, everything's bad until it's good. Yes. Everything, oh, we're in trouble. Like, we're going out yeah. to dinner tonight. Yep. All right? Very oh. excited. 
DVRing the Met game, don't worry. Oh, I had no fear. I know. Don't worry about it. Going I out to Was I concerned you were going to miss the Met game tonight? I was not. <laughs> oddly enough. So we were talking about right. where is, we're just, going Is there room death. on the table for the book? That's the only question. <laughs> well, luckily, Craig's on vacation. He's not just going to show up at our date night, <laughs> which I'm very <laughs> happy about. Then again, yes. So I know there's a restaurant she wants to go to. Mm-hmm. We don't know if we can get a reservation. Now, could you imagine if I called up my wife right now and said, look, we're set. We got the reservation. Oh. But I don't actually have the reservation. Mm-hmm. But I think it's going to be fine. Yeah. I think it's going to be fine. I'm pretty sure it's going to be fine. Right. But I tell her, hey, it's going to be fine. We got a reservation. And then about an hour before I'm in the car, I'm like, all right, I got bad news. Yeah. It's book solid. No. Book solid. <laughs> there was a flood. Something tragic happened. The stove stopped working. The, the <laughs> chef had an emergency. You never just say, I didn't make the reservations. Right. Something tragic happened, and we can't get to the restaurant. That the would, car doesn't start. You got to go out there and cut your own brakes. That would you go do over something. very, very badly. Oh, very badly. As opposed to, hey, look, mm-hmm. I don't know if we're going to get a reservation. It's going to be real tough, right. but I'm going to try. Yes. And then if somehow I got a reservation, I'm a freaking hero. Mm-hmm. I beat Al Gore's ass in that presidential debate. See right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Locked I, box? Yeah. <laughs> Craig didn't get that reference two weeks ago. No, nope. I'm still not sure I did, but I chuckled anyway because I'm on the show with you, and the last thing I want to do is make you feel stupid. So that was hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. Evan, man, you cracked me up. We will, box. We will get to the Mets who showed that they don't believe in freaking letdowns. And I some- told you. Buck does not allow letdowns. You see what you're doing? I told you. You see what you're doing? The guy, he refuses to allow the team to accept letdowns. You right out the gate, boom, mark the home run. They're flying. You see what you're doing right now? I'm telling you how good the Mets are and how they a... don't have a mindset. that is, They have a leader <laughs> who doesn't allow a mindset of you're... failure in any way, including letdowns. It doesn't happen. You're being a sarcastic dude. I'm just, I'm not. You kind of are. I'm not. <laughs> this is what you do. No, Buck, Buck. He's established a culture in that clubhouse that refuses letdowns. Just remember this, Mets fans. When the Mets win, if you need that sarcasm from anyone, I'm not you're being get sarcastic. It from the big man to my left. The guy is unbelievable. He's the greatest manager of all time. I didn't say that. Of this season? <laughs> he right? a- Con- considering every other manager in baseball is just a, a puppet for the GM. <laughs> right. And Buck is the one true manager out there allowed to make his hey. own decisions. Hey. And look at how that's paying off. Hey, you saw what Buck did last night. The rest of the league night. should look, take a round. What Buck did last night, and he's going to have to do this in the postseason, is he had a pitcher walk off the mound after seven innings with a pitch count over 100 yep. and mouth to him, mm-hmm. I got another. And Buck didn't go to his books and nope. say, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. Nope. Let me see what these numbers tell me. He said, okay, you want another inning, big shot? Yep. Go out and pitch another inning. Completely agree. I'm so glad he did it. You know when else that happened? There was a game in the 2015 World Series where a pitcher came off the mound and he was like, you know what? I'm going back out there. And the manager was smart enough to say, you know what, buddy? You're right. You're the dark knight. You own this city. You get back out there and you finish this First of all, it's completely, completely (laughs) different. And the fact you brought up that wound to me, (laughs) like, you don't want me to break this down. It reminded me. No, it didn't remind me. Well, you seem so pleased with it. I figured you'd be pleased in any situation that that would have taken place. There's a difference between August, I've got no (laughs) bullpen. I don't know who's available. Yeah. It's the middle of the order against the Cincinnati freaking Reds. Right. And the World Series when I've got J. Riz Familia, who I can give a clean inning to. Okay. And it's Matt Harvey taking on Lorenzo Cain and Eric Cosmo. Okay. Just making sure that there is a distinction. You got it. There's I, a huge distinction. All right. You got it. You, you, you sold me. I just wanted to see if how you felt about all those situations. You're pissing me off. 